Hello, hello folks, Eric Hansen here, and I'm here to talk to you about a little show called Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. Released in 1978, this 13-part miniseries, hosted by famed scientist Carl Sagan, was one of the culturally defining moments of the time, inviting its viewers on a trip out beyond the furthest reaches of the known universe, all the way down to the smallest particle. Multiple Emmy and Peabody Awards notwithstanding, it is now considered one of the greatest television shows of all time and remains unmatched in the annals of educational programming. With the new voyage, hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson, having drawn to a close, I think it would be fun to go back over the original show and check out some of my personal favorite moments. So here we are, my top 10 favorite moments from Cosmos Personal Voyage. Number 10, Whale Song. I never was too concerned with the well-being of cetaceans until I saw this episode. In this segment, Carl opens up the idea of learning to understand alien languages by first practicing on some of Earth's other intelligent creatures, in this case, humpback whales. If I imagine that the songs of the humpback whale are sung in a tonal language, then the number of bits of information in one song is about the same as the information content of the Iliad or the Odyssey. In doing this, Carl instills them with a certain majesty, and hearing their song now evokes a sense of mystery, leaving you wondering, yeah, just what are they saying to each other? Oh, and there's this part too. Whoop. Oh. Classic Carl. <laughs> what I like about this segment is it does contain an anti-whaling message, but instead of using a cheap appeal to emotion, it asks its audience, what opportunities will we as a species be wasting if we let these creatures perish? Is it just a romantic notion that the whales and their cousins the dolphins might have something akin to epic poetry? Number 9. Carl's Dream In easily one of the most haunting scenes in the entire series, Carl recalls a dream he had that began with him taking a voyage to the furthest stars. It begins uplifting enough, him exploring the flourishing technological civilizations throughout the galaxy. But then... But suddenly, darkness, total and absolute. There must have been signs they were in trouble. Probability of survival in a century Less than 1%, not very good odds. Communications interrupted. Their world society had failed. They had made the ultimate mistake. But by far the most haunting moment is Carl's tragic return home. Then, suddenly, silence. Could it have been a plague or nuclear war? Probability of survival over a century. Here also, less than 1%. So it was nuclear war, a full nuclear exchange. There would be no more big questions, no more answers. Never again a love or a child. No descendants to remember us and be proud. No more voyages to the stars. No more songs from the earth. What makes this little sketch work so well is it comes across not as a bland list of facts, but a brilliant work of literature. Carl leaving Earth on a spiritual journey that he wanted to share with the rest of humanity, only for them to self-destruct while he's away, serves as an effective warning for what may happen in the future if we are not careful. Number 8, Samurai Crabs. This episode begins very interestingly in that it's not a science lesson, but a history lesson. Carl begins this little sketch by telling us of a great war between two samurai clans that culminated in the suicide of Japan's young emperor. What does this have to do with science? The answer is crabs. There are crabs to be found here which have curious markings on their backs, patterns which resemble a human face with the aggressive scowl of a samurai warrior from medieval Japan. Carl uses this as a segue to give a very good example of how natural selection works in explaining away the very strange markings on the crabs found near the site of the battle. Patterns on the back or carapace of this crab are inherited, but among crabs, 
as among humans, there are many different hereditary lines. Now, suppose purely by chance, among the distant ancestors of this crab, there came to be one which looked just a little bit like a human face. Long before the battle, fishermen may have been reluctant to eat a crab with a human face. In throwing it back into the sea, they were setting into motion a process of selection. If you're a crab and your carapace is just ordinary, the humans are going to eat you. But if it looks a little bit like a face, they'll throw you back and you'll be able to have lots of nice little baby crabs that all look just like you. This is the beginning of our marvelous tour into the world of biology and evolution, a solid example of the mechanisms behind what makes life change over time. Number seven, some of the things that molecules do. In this brilliant animated segment from early on in the series, Carl takes us down the road of one of the universe's greatest machines, the machinery of life itself. Here, he traces the humble beginnings of life on Earth all the way up to modern day, painting a picture akin to that of a great novel. One line took to the trees, developing dexterity, stereo vision, larger brains, and a curiosity about their environment. Some became baboons, but that's not the line to us. Apes and humans have a recent common ancestor. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, molecule for molecule. There are almost no important differences between apes and humans. We with our brains in our hands, are the survivors. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. While some view evolution as demeaning, Carl Sagan shows it as inspiring. How we could spring from such humble beginnings to become what we are now, and opening up hope for what the future may hold for us. Those are some of the things that molecules do, given four billion years of evolution. Number six. Mr. Apple in Flatland. In this segment, Carl explains just how difficult it would be for us as three-dimensional creatures to understand any dimensions outside of three. He does this by breaking us down to two dimensions and using a third dimension as the example of something very alien. Everybody in Flatland is, of course, exceptionally flat. We have squares, circles, and triangles, and we all scurry about, and we can go into our houses and do our flat business. We know, us flatlanders, about left, right, and we know about forward, back, but we have never heard of up, down. Let us imagine that into flatland, hovering above it, comes a strange three-dimensional creature which, oddly enough, looks like an apple. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square, watches it enter its house, and decides in a gesture of interdimensional amity to say hello. What I really like about this scene is it always reminded me of the type of thing you'd see on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, very much aided by Sagan's casual and friendly demeanor. But after a while, he comes to realize that he is seeing inside closed rooms in Flatland. He is looking inside his fellow flat creatures he is seeing Flatland from a perspective no one has ever seen it before to his knowledge. Getting into another dimension provides as an incidental benefit a kind of X-ray vision. This scene really does hit at home just how alien our dimensions would be to something that is two-dimensional, and leaves you wondering what alien dimensions like the fourth and beyond would be like to us. I was in some other mystic dimension called Up. And they will pat him on his side and comfort him, or else they'll ask, well, show us, where is that three dimen third dimension? Point to it. And the poor square will be unable to comply. Number five, kind of the speed of light. The theory of relativity and how time slows down as you approach the speed of light was always something that confused me about physics. But in this segment of the series, Carl Sagan did the impossible. He made a simpleton like me actually understand it. To a passerby, Paolo appears blue-shifted when approaching, red-shifted when receding. But to him, the entire world is both coming and going at nearly the speed of light. Sagan further elaborates on this idea in this scene. The most bizarre aspect of traveling near the speed of light is that time slows down. All clocks, mechanical and biological, tick more slowly near the speed of light. But stationary clocks tick at their usual rate. If we travel close to light speed, 
we age more slowly than those we left behind. Paolo's watch and his internal sense of time show that he's been gone from his friends for only a few minutes. But from their point of view, he has been away for many decades, and his younger brother has been patiently waiting for him all this time. Putting a very difficult concept like this into terms that a guy like me can understand, it is now difficult to imagine the universe any other way. This was just a thought experiment, but atomic particles traveling near the speed of light do decay more slowly than stationary particles. As strange and counterintuitive as it seems, time dilation is a law of nature. Number four, a still more glorious dawn. In our little corner of the universe, we often forget that at any given point in space, the sky will appear vastly different than it does here. And this show hits it out of the park in this little segment that deals with a morning on a faraway world. We on Earth marvel, and rightly so, at the daily return of our single sun. But from a planet orbiting a star in a distant globular cluster, a still more glorious dawn awaits. Not a sunrise, but a galaxy rise. A morning filled with 400 billion suns, the rising of the Milky Way. An enormous spiral form with collapsing gas clouds, condensing planetary systems, luminous supergiants, stable middle-aged stars, red giants, white dwarfs, planetary nebulas, supernovas, neutron stars, pulsars, black holes, and, there is every reason to think, other exotic objects that we have not yet discovered. From such a world, high above the disk of the Milky Way, it would be clear, as it is beginning to be clear on our world, that we are made by the atoms and the stars, that our matter and our form are determined by the cosmos of which we are a part. It is a very simple concept and remarkably poetic. Taking a step back at the vast galaxy we call home makes the viewer feel smaller, but somehow grander in looking back at the picture to which we all belong. Number three, the Drake Equation. Aliens, they're one of the great mysteries of the cosmos. Do they exist? And if so, how many of them are there? What will they look like? What will they think like? And will we ever meet them? Carl devoted an entire episode to the search for extraterrestrial life, and here he showcases what is known as the Drake Equation, a mathematical equation used to give a rough number of how many civilizations there might be in any given galaxy. How many advanced civilizations capable, at least of radio astronomy, are there in the Milky Way galaxy? Let's call the number of such civilizations by the capital letter N. If we multiply all these numbers together, We've estimated, capital N, the number of civilizations. What's really good about this segment is Carl does not lean towards any one possibility. He's sure to give his viewers multiple options as to not create bias, and invites us to draw our own conclusions based on the evidence he's presented. Civilizations then might take billions of years of tortuous evolution to arise, and then snuff themselves out in an instant of unforgivable neglect. If this is a typical case, there may be few others maybe nobody else at all for us to talk to. If only 1% of civilizations can survive technological adolescence, then F sub big L would be not a hundred millionth, but only a hundredth. And then the number of civilizations would be a billion times a hundredth. The number of civilizations in the galaxy then would be measured in the millions. Still, by the end, he leaves us with a sense of wonder. What if? Then the sky may be softly humming with messages from the stars, with signals from civilizations enormously older and wiser than we. Number two, the cosmic calendar. Ah, what would Cosmos A Personal Voyage be without the Cosmic Calendar? One of the most iconic images of the series. So iconic was it that it was carried over to the recent sequel. The Cosmic Calendar compresses the local history of the universe into a single year. If the universe began on January 1st, it was not until May 
that the Milky Way formed. Other planetary systems may have appeared in June, July, and August, but our Sun and Earth not until mid-September. Possibly the greatest revelation provided by this calendar is this point right here on the tour of the cosmic year. In the vast ocean of time which this calendar represents, all our memories are confined to this small square. Every person we've ever heard of lived somewhere in there. All those kings and battles, migrations and inventions, wars and loves, everything in the history books happens here in the last 10 seconds of the cosmic calendar. To take all that we know and show just how little time it took up on the cosmic year makes all of our little battles and quarrels and disagreements seem, well, petty. In looking back at our vast history from this perspective, all condensed into a single bright light at the lower corner of the known universe's history, makes you feel closer to your fellow human beings than ever before. We on Earth have just awakened to the great oceans of space and time from which we have emerged. We are the legacy of 15 billion years of cosmic evolution. We have a choice. We can enhance life and come to know the universe that made us, or we can squander our 15 billion year heritage in meaningless self-destruction. And my number one favorite cosmos moment is... Voyage begins. This scene of Carl standing atop a cliff and speaking over the sound of crashing waves will always be my favorite. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Our contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the grandest of mysteries. Not only does it contain one of the show's most endearing statements, some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return, and we can because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. It is my favorite because the moment you see it, you know it is the beginning of something great. By the end of this scene, eager excitement has been ignited, an almost uncontrollable anticipation for every moment that is to come. Not just the ones listed above, but countless others. The journey to the single cell, making an apple pie, a Google Plex, and many more unnamed. With each breath, word, image, and subject, a pulsing life resonates that leaves the viewer feeling exhilarated and wanting more. And whenever I see it, I take great joy in preparing to discover the wonders of the universe all over again. Some of you may be wondering why some of the more famous quotes are not here. The answer to that question is simple. These are the moments that I took away from the show. Your list may be very different, and there's only one way to find out what that list is. Hop on the spaceship of imagination, let Carl be your guide, and travel to the cosmos to see what messages affect you the most. I'm Eric Hansen. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and I'll see you around. Later.